Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for being a little bit patient. Uh, we still have one commissioner that should be here very shortly. Um, first of all, welcome everybody to our workshop, uh, long awaited workshop, whether our schedules or the pandemic got in the way. Um, but we're here today. And um, first of all, I just wanted to thank the Hilton staff for putting this together. It looks, uh, I think everybody should feel comfortable. Hopefully you do. If you don't, let us know. Um, and also to our staff for putting this together. I think this is um, a great spot, good location. Hopefully it was easy for everybody to get to. Um, as it relates to the masks, we um, obviously told everybody that we'd be using them if we were here. So to the best of your abilities, uh, please wear them. If you can't wear them, we understand. Don't feel obliged to, to wear it, but uh, we're asking everybody to do it. Um, obviously, if you need to get away from these things, you can step outside for sure and get some fresh air if you'd like. Um, I just first of all wanted to say thanks for being here. I mean, normally you just say thanks for coming and it's, it's great, but I know that this is a, 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 an in-person meeting and it's not an easy thing to make personal decisions like that it seems to be the, uh, the week for in-person meetings. We've had, this is my third of the week. We haven't had any up until now. So um, really appreciate your efforts. Everybody that's here, Mariella, thank you for joining us today. So glad you could make it. All, all nine of us will be here today to discuss. We have staff here and our leadership from, uh, from Anna Lee and Carlos. So looking forward to that. Um, Today, I think, is important. I think the next five years for Tampa Bay Water are critically important. Not that the first 20 haven't been important, but I think the next five will set the groundwork for the remaining 18 years and hopefully much longer that Tampa Bay Water is in existence. So we've got a lot of uh, things to, to go over today. I think it's going to take a real strategic thinking process, whether it's at the board level, at our senior executive level or even down into the organization as we uh, kind of put together that direction that we want Tampa Bay Water to go in for the next, uh, well, 20 years, so to speak. But we got some work to do. So with that said, I am uh, looking forward to today and, and to your leadership as we go through today. And uh, I, I'm turning the rest of the meeting over to you. So, so go. Thank you. All right. I'm, uh, I'm going to start the meeting. Um, I... Uh, First of all, I want to uh, thank the board and the staff, really, for putting together um, this room during these very difficult circumstances and something that I think everybody feels very safe in, uh, and that's uh, very helpful in what we're going to do today. So I want to uh, thank uh, especially staff uh, for putting this together. I am uh, Carlos Alvarez, and this is Annalie Mays. Some of you have met one, one or both of us, or some of you haven't met all both of us. But uh, Annalie and I, uh, even though we don't have a firm together, we worked together before, uh, and uh, and we've done some facilitation work uh, in past years. Um, and so we're delighted to do this. And I know most of you know that Annalie has been involved with Tampa Bay Water in a facilitation uh, 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 mode uh, really at the beginning of this uh, wonderful organization. So she has a long history with it. I don't have as long a history with it. Actually, my only history is actually being as an arbitrator with the Hillsborough County um, 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 reservoir that was built in the uh, early uh, 2000. I was just one of the media, uh, one of the arbitrators uh, in that panel. I was the chief arbitrator selected by the two other arbitrators. But what I'm really excited about is because I've always heard so much about Tampa Bay Water because I have dealt with other wholesale water uh, authorities throughout the state in my work as a mediator. And uh, your reputation is stellar. And so it is a pleasure for me uh, to be here uh, and uh, working with you uh, in this workshop and in, in the two uh, future workshops. Now. Um, um, one of the things I want to say right off the bat is to also all the board members to thank you for your service um, as, um, you know, serving your communities. Oftentimes when you have, uh, of course, having this workshop, any organization is going to have its frictions and its disagreements and all of that. But 
we often forget the things that unite us are much greater than the things that divide us. And as I look around and you know, prepared for this, um, there are decades of public service experience among the nine board members. You have served this community well, all of you. All of you are Floridians. All of you have uh, extended yourself in public service. And when I say extended yourself, is because I know. Uh, the only office I ever ran for was um, uh, uh, president of my high school student body. I lost that election, and that was it for me. <laughs> but luckily, I was selected to be um, to chair the Florida Elections Commission for about six years in the 1990s. And being the chair of the Florida Elections Commission has taught me that being an elected official is a very, very demanding task in all kinds of ways. So whenever I'm in front of anybody who's run for office, I'd like to say thank you for having done that and for continuing to serve your community. But remember, all of you, decades of service, it's really, uh, really what unites you uh, in this endeavor with Tampa Bay Water. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the facilitator's role. Now, I know probably most of you have um, been involved in a facilitation of some type. Um, and, uh, and that's excellent. Uh, but I think it's always helpful to understand where the facilitators are coming from that you're in front of. I think every facilitator, like every mediator, has a different, uh, little different style. And I think you'll get used to our style as we go through. But there are certain things that are true to just about any facilitation. Um, and so the way I describe uh, a facilitator's role is our role is to make a discussion, the discussion that is going to happen productive and collaborative. Again, the discussion that's going to happen, productive and collaborative. And I think anything that you do in the facilitation, you can put it under those two big headings. Productive, I think most of you know that you've been in meetings where at the end of the day, at that meeting, you feel, what have we accomplished? Well, that doesn't become very productive for the needs of the organization. Uh, so productive is, really means that the, uh, the meeting will uh, help the organization achieve the goals that the organization sets for itself. That it will actually be productive to that end. Collaborative means that the discussion is had in such a way that everybody is involved in it. Everybody feels they've had their say, and everybody deals with issues involved in that facilitation and not in personal matters. So um, you learn how to work with each other in a way that you're attacking issues and you're not attacking persons. And so everything that happens in a facilitation is, again, to deal with productivity and to deal with collaboration. Now, in trying to reach those goals of a facilitation, there are certain tools that a facilitator uses. And so I'll just go over a few. There are others that will come out as we go through today. But there's, there are some that, uh, that uh, you should know. One that is essential is that we're neutrals. Uh, Annalee and I uh, are both neutrals. And what that means is that we're not here to resolve the problem. We're here to guide you in you resolving the problem or the issues that are at hand. We do not get involved with that, but hopefully we can guide you in dealing with that. So we remain neutral. We don't take sides. We don't make the suggestions of where to go. We really expect all of that to be from you, and we guide you to try to get that from you as we move along. So neutrality 
is a key aspect of uh, a facilitator, uh, a, a facilitation. Uh, the other thing to keep in uh, another rule is that we like everybody to participate. We don't like some people to participate and other people uh, to not participate. We like everybody to participate so that we have a full discussion of the issues at hand. Nobody uh, keeps quiet and then later on says, well, I had this point to make regarding that issue. We want everybody to facilitate, so we do want a balanced participation of the whole group. Um, another, uh, another point on, the, uh, on these issues is that we try to reach consensus um, in matters that uh, we need a decision on. Uh, and that becomes a very important aspect of a facilitation. But consensus, and keep this in mind, and maybe, as you know, Steve Seibert is going to talk about um, the beginnings of Tampa Bay Water later on, and he may want to touch on this. Consensus doesn't mean that you get absolutely your way. Consensus means that whatever um, agreement is trying to be reached, it may not be your first choice, but it's a choice that you can live with. So most things that are um, in the nature of public policy, uh, no one gets kind of their first shot at it and gets it through. Everybody, there is a bit of a compromise. So consensus means that you may have, that may be not your first choice, and sometimes it's not even your second choice, but it is a choice that you can live with. So we will try to reach anything that we have, uh, to re anything that we have to reach agreement with in this matter, we're trying to reach it by consensus. And that's, uh, that's the definition of consensus. Um, also part of the mediator's role is creating, and, and this is, falls kind of in the column of productivity, is creating summaries of what is being said. That's why you see these boards up here and Annalie ready to write. She's probably the best at it that I've ever seen. Um, that substantive points that are made are going to be written up. Uh, and she's going to put them up there. Uh, and also decisions make or action items or things like that. They're going to be written down. So that at the end of this meeting, we'll know where we have been and where we need to go. And uh, those summaries, so uh, even though they'll be on, on these boards, eventually will be written uh, you know, in some kind of word format and given to everyone so that everyone, everybody sees what was accomplished in this meeting and um, uh, what, where we go next, um, action items and everything else. So part of the summary, uh, the, the written summary, is one of the key aspects that you'll see in a, in a facilitation. And it becomes a, a very important part of that process. Um, and um, another key aspect of a facilitation is, uh, and this is really hard to describe, except that you know, we, we try to make uh, everyone speak a little bit clearer and everyone listen a little bit better. You know, you can go into active listening, you can get all kinds of technical terms, but really the, the, uh, the key point to take is everybody speak a little bit clearer. And the way I, I describe it uh, when i uh, doing my, my mediation work is, you know, speak in a way that would make the other person want to hear you. And then uh, on the other side, listen in a way that would make the other person want to talk to you. Like, for example, on the active listening point is make sure you do understand what this person just said. Any questions about it, uh, and it all depends on time and all of that, but, you know, question the person about anything that you have any doubts of. Sometimes you can rephrase it back to them, but that is active listening where you're really trying to get the point that is being made. But as part of a facilitation, active listening and, listen, and uh, speaking in a way that the other side 
uh, the, speaking in a way that the other people you're speaking to will want to listen to you becomes absolutely crucial. So those are uh, some of the tools that are used by, uh, I think, by just about every facilitator um, and some of the things that we'll be, we'll be doing today. Um, now, I'm going to go over the agenda real quick. And this is, you have the agenda in front of you, so I'm not going to uh, belabor the point, but just to give you a brief overview of uh, where we're headed. Um, you see the objectives at the top of the page. And that's, uh, I'm going to read them because the objectives are very important. Uh, to establish ground rules for the workshop. And Anna Lee will be doing that right after I finish talking. Uh, to get to know each other better. Uh, and that's really part uh, of the warm-up introductions that Anna Lee would also be doing um, after, the, uh, after the ground rules are set. To review the origins of Tampa Bay water. Uh, uh, and that'll be led, uh, well, we'll lead with that, uh, with Mr. Steve Seibert, who is here, who uh, happens to be a dear friend of mine. Uh, we don't see each other very often, but we have practiced in the same area of law for, for God many years, and, and uh, I'm excited to, to have him here. And uh, he will give us uh, uh, some thoughts regarding that. And I'll talk more about that when I introduce Steve. And then perhaps this is the heart of the facilitation, which is the, um, the, the acronym is SWAT, but it's the uh, the articulation of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats facing the organization or Tampa Bay Water. And uh, that is a very, uh, like I said, a very important aspect of today's uh, facilitation. And uh, again, we will talk more, pre uh, more specifically about that uh, when that comes up. And then the last part is really a summary by me uh, of what happened today, and that'll be brief. Uh, there'll be, of course, the written summary later on. And, uh, and then uh, thinking about what are the next steps. Because this is the first of three workshops. That's the way it's planned. And look at it this way. It's, it's you know, we heard this sort of in first grade, but it still makes sense in these times of facilitation. Today we're building the foundation. That's where we're taking some, some time, really, to talk about, to get to know each other a little bit better. Today we're taking the first step in building this foundation of hopefully uh, 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 making this group or any group better in terms of communication and problem solving. So today we're building that foundation and then the next two uh, facilitation sessions we will build on that foundation uh, and uh, deal with uh, more substantive issues. Okay, does anybody have any questions from that? I know this is, uh, again, I thank you. I know this is difficult doing it with a mask. It's difficult for me <laughs> to speak with a mask. Um, um, so if, uh, again, if somebody's not understanding what we're saying because we have a mask, you know, raise your hand, we'll work it out in some fashion. Annalie? Okay. Um, I'll echo what Carlo said and say I'm really glad to be here. I was suggesting to a couple of you that I kind of felt like as you came in, you should have been on a loudspeaker broadcasting the song at last because it's taken us a long time to get here. But we're uh, very glad to finally uh, be here. Um, I want to just mention we're get, the next with the exception of when Steve is speaking, it's going to be very interactive. Um, because Commissioner Smith is with us by video, she has a proxy in the room, and that is Michelle Robinson. Um, so they're going to be uh, communicating um, by phone, by FaceTime, by um, whatever the technology is that has us um, showing her uh, throughout the process, but she will be fully participating with Michelle's help. Um, turn to the first worksheet. 
worksheet number one, ground rules. Okay, so what we'd like to do with this exercise is uh, come up with some ground rules that you will um, use for this workshop and subsequent workshops. Um, I want you to take a minute to think, and you can use this paper as kind of a note, place to make notes. So uh, think about some meetings that you've been in and about behaviors in that meeting that helped them flow and be productive. What were those behaviors? Um, we want to uh, pull them from you and establish them as ground rules for these workshops. Um, make some notes, as I said, on the worksheet, and then we'll do a round robin, and I'll post them, and then we have a process for putting some priority on your ideas. So go ahead and take a minute to think about what ground rules you'd like to operate under and make some notes. Okay, everybody ready? Okay, so we're gonna do this in a round robin. Uh, I want one suggestion from each person at a time. We can go around the room as many times as we need to to capture all of your ideas for ground rules. Uh, Commissioner Peters, we can start with you. No idea, dismissed out of hand. Commissioner okay. Roman. Um, chair or the organizer keeps comments and questions to the point.
Commissioner Starkey. Okay, in these um, sessions, as Carlos has kind of explained, we're, we're, we're not going to be doing Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, that's for your board meeting. Okay. Okay. Agree to disagree. I'm having major trouble with Carlos. Didn't have all my So we're going to aim for consensus, but you envision perhaps some times when we might have to agree to disagree. Okay, Commissioner Edwards. Yeah, when I was looking at the flow and productivity of a meeting, and I was thinking of a of a good icebreaker and sharing of a sharing of personal uh, personal backgrounds. Okay. Councilman Miranda. Little understanding. Say a bit again. Little understanding. Tell me what you mean by that. Small amounts of information for a large quantity of, of uh, discussion. Okay, so what you're saying is you don't want to spend a lot of time people no, giving you information. What I'm trying to convey is that uh, under the ground rules that were set up 100 years ago, there's still little understanding of the needs for everybody and why we speak the way we speak. Okay, so your ground rule would be to help people understand? Understanding of the facts of each individual government. That's okay. what I'm trying to say. Commissioner Oakley. Um, I guess a discussion of a present, presentation of the uh, subject matter that we're going to discuss uh, so that we have a little background where, where we want to go so we can discuss and then together determine which route we go. <laughs> now here. Here. This. <laughs> Is that what you mean? Include background information to inform the discussion? Is that fair? Council Member Rice. Okay. Commissioner Smith. Commissioner Smith, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, your turn. Yeah, um, my, uh, I agree with a lot of the points that have been said before. I would underline the first one, uh, sort of the brainstorming rule that no ideas are dismissed out of hand. All ideas uh, come forward with equal uh, respect. Okay. Okay, any other additional one that you'd uh, like to offer? When you're last, it's a little tougher. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I have okay. one that there would be no personal attacks. No personal attacks. And that's the same one I had, so you don't have to call on me. <laughs> 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 I just said never be personal. <laughs> right. Or combative behavior. Yeah. I don't think anybody in here is going to be combative, but. 
Okay, that was going to be what you were going to say, Commissioner Yes, Starkey. that would be personal safety. Okay. Mayor, another one. Commissioner Peters, another one. Pardon? Body language. Body language. Tell me what you're thinking um, about that. If, if you don't agree with what somebody says, be careful on what, rolling your eyes, that kind of thing. Large size. <laughs> no rolling of Groans, eyes. Groans, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that could be, <laughs> be very expressive. <laughs> yeah, I get in trouble with that one. <laughs> okay, any others? I have some stories. <laughs> Councilman Miranda, anything else? No, I was going to say the body language, uh, like uh, the commissioner said, because uh, body language is much more powerful than words. However, I'll add one to it, uh, and that is I listen most what people don't say. Okay. And why is that important? Well, because if you're a subject matter, you're expecting to have some kind of understanding of what the conversation is. So sometimes you have to filter out if the individual you're talking with, and I'm not talking about this body, anybody of uh, individuals, that what they say is one thing and what they do is another. Okay. So, in this forum might be an opportunity to clarify if you're feeling like you're getting mixed messages. I don't feel any way I feel like. Okay. Anything else, Commissioner Oakley? Council Member Rice? And they become a reference point for the group that if we feel like we're straying from the ground rules, then you all have an opportunity to call that to each other's attention. Uh, Carlos and I also can um, point out when we are deviating from the ground rules. Okay, Commissioner Eggers, did you have any? Anybody else? Commissioner Smith, did you have another one? No, thank you. I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Here. If you put it on before you take it off, it works better. Yeah. That's fine. Okay, so you have at your table four sticky dots. And so what we want to do is put some priority on these. Before we do that, are there any up there that you think need some clarification? Any that you think are duplicative of each other? No? Okay. All right, so sometimes when we use these sticky dots to put some priority on brainstormed ideas, we have what's called a herd effect. So what I want you to do is just write the number on a sticky dot of the ground rule that you think is most important. And then when everybody's done that, we're going to post. Oh, so where's, are we supposed to write those on here? Yeah, write them. Okay. So for example, if you think number one, no interruptions is most important ground rule to follow, then you're going to put a one on your sticky dot. So pick four.
Everybody ready? No. No. I'm just reading <laughs> through them again. Does 11 say, please? Pardon? Listen 11. to what people don't say. Oh, okay. Listen for what, for what people don't say. Now are we ready? Okay, I'm going to give you a chance to get out of your chair. Go ahead and put your dot by the number, the ones you have chosen. I'm having trouble hearing you through the, through the mask. Okay, go ahead and get out of your chair and go ahead and post the dot on the numbers that you have chosen. Okay, looks like the, um, the ones that people consider most important for following, no idea, dismissed out of hand, uh, keeping comments and questions to the point, uh, agree to disagree when that's necessary, um, respect the time limits, no personal attacks, and being careful of body language. Okay, those seem like reasonable ground rules for you all to follow. Okay, good. Um, turn to worksheet number two. Okay, 
this is the opportunity that uh, Commissioner Eggers mentioned. It's the opportunity for us to get to know each other a little better. It's an important part of what Carlos was talking about at the beginning, about laying the foundation for future work by this board, both in these workshops and as you um, continue to meet as a group. So it's just an opportunity to make it fun, just get to know each other a little bit. We're gonna do it in groups of three and the way it works is I want each of you to take a minute or two to tell your group a little bit about yourself, what your career highlights have been, something about your personal life, like where you were born and raised, what you like to do outside of work, something about your family, and then finally something unique about you that not a lot of people know. So we're in a public forum, so not your deepest and darkest secret, but <laughs> something that not a lot of people know that would be um, somewhat revealing of your personality and who you are. Um, then once you have introduced yourselves to each other, I want you to have a group discussion of this question. What are your hopes <coughs> and expectations for these workshops? Then when we come back in the full group, each of you are going to introduce someone in your group. So you're gonna take turns. So for example, Mayor Marlowe may choose to introduce Commissioner Peters. Commissioner Peters might choose to introduce Commissioner Merman. And then one of you pick Mayor Marlowe to introduce him. Um, and so you want to take notes, you know, when somebody's telling you a little bit about themselves. And then the last person to speak in your group, your three-person group, uh, should share with the rest of us what came out of your discussion about your hopes and expectations for the workshops. So I think the easiest thing to do, um, this group with Commissioner Smith is going to go into another room so they can avail themselves of the technology. What I would suggest you do is kind of back up from your table and turn toward each other and try and keep social, socially distanced as best you can, but have a conversation. So it's gonna be the three of you and the three of you and the three of you. Pardon? Um, I would say uh, two to three minutes each. Um, in the breakout, I would say about Annalise. five to seven minutes total. How, how much time total for us? So in your small group, about five to seven minutes. Okay. And then when you come back, we'll take, you know, try and, um, we got to have nine people share what they heard, so. Just left room. <laughs> yeah, because I have to talk to somebody on the phone, I think. Yeah. Okay, everybody clear? Okay. okay. So Okay, well let's hear what we learned about each other. Um, should we let this group in the middle start? Who wants to start? Okay. So t take a minute, try and be brief, sharing what you learned about the person and then the last person to speak, tell us what your discussion about what you want to get out of the workshops. So for that reason, I'll go first. Okay, so I'm gonna inter introduce um, Commissioner Eggers. Okay. Um, so Mr. Con uh, uh, Commissioner Eggers' um, career highlight, he felt that it was the first time he was elected and that he had um, affirmation and uh, of that there were, were a lot of people that were looking for him to help them and that great responsibility and exhilaration. So that was, that was a real highlight for him. Um, he was born in St. Charles, Missouri, but very interestingly, he. Uh, lived uh, most of his life in Peru and Guatemala, 
His father was in the construction industry, and he feels that gave him a really uh, interesting perspective. You know, when you, when you live and are immersed in other cultures, it really opens your eyes to what a bigger world we have out there. Um, he loves to listen to people's stories. So we, we had a great, uh, great stories from, from uh, Councilman Miranda. Um, he is a sports nut, so uh, what he likes to do outside of work is, I think, anything sports related. And, he, um, and in that regard, he loves to umpire baseball. And uh, one of the, one of the uh, things he learned uh, being an umpire is to pause, read, and react. And he's carried that kind of mantra throughout his life into his elected uh, career. And what people don't know about him is that he loves to travel. Loves to travel, okay. Really? You must be dying with all the lack of sports. <laughs> it's killing you. <laughs> it must be killing you. Re okay. Replays are just not <laughs> Yeah, not the same. Yeah, about okay. Commissioner Kathy Starkey, she's an individual who uh, I didn't know at the past until we had the little discussion now how well versed she is in a lot of sports. Uh, she was married to a professional baseball player for some time, and she is a lady who loves family, who loves her political life, who enjoys traveling, and of all cooking. So we're going to make a reservation in her house after this meeting, and we'll have a fantastic dinner. But she's a, a truly an individual that I've never had, a, even though I sat close to her in the boardrooms, I never really got to know that she's a very nice human being who really likes people. Okay. All right. Born in Northern California. Northern yeah, California. Born in Northern California. Yeah. Born in North California, but she decided to move here. Okay. Four Twice. children, and she loves traveling. Right. Adventure travel. So you have that, North, you have that in, in common. California. Huh? Where in Northern California? A Redwood City. Redwood City. And uh, my, my unique thing is, my, my favorite thing to do is mountain bike. Okay. People would so, think that about me. Commissioner <laughs> Eggers likes to travel, but you like adventure travel. I like adventure travel, travel yeah. Okay. I'm, all right. Go I'm ahead. LA, I, I, I'm, I'm doing just, all kinds of things. We were talking about being a story, to, uh, like, I like hearing storytelling. So hearing uh, Charlie talk about his upbringing uh, was pretty neat. Um, Born in, born in Ybor City, uh, great parents who didn't have much. Uh, lived in um, Tampa Housing Authority, uh, never had a car. Had two brothers, um, and uh, he ended up having three kids himself, eight grandchildren, three, uh, six granddaughters. Um, and in his family, his mother was the disciplinary. Um, so, you know, like, I got spanked when I was little. He got spanked by his mother when he was little at keeping him in line. And she somewhat succeeded, but he's never in line. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, he thinks that as he goes through life that he really learns from just about everybody that he comes into contact with something and that he can take that as a, as a part of who he is. Um, he is a uh, genuine, he's a baseball, avid baseball. He actually played with Tony La Russa. He played uh, all-star baseball in Cuba against the Cuban na national team. Um, he is a, um, he works, he has two jobs. He, his, his hobby is working. At 80 years old, he just loves to work, and I just admire that so, so much. Um, he worked for the state of Florida in uh, judging horse racing. And he's been around the horses all his life. He said he's made more millionaires out of billionaires in his business, <laughs> which, I thought was, which I thought was great. Um, and just a, it's just a real, it's really proud to be a part of the city of Tampa and a council member there. And, um, and uh, I guess that's about, that's about it for Charlie. Okay. Um, but it's just a thank you for sharing, sharing all of that. Um, and we just, we were just thinking it today, today is just uh, more ways to improve as individuals and as a group. Um, understanding where we come from is important, the, the kind of that basis of Tampa Bay water, and then uh, kind of an appreciation for where we're going and hopefully that we're all kind of in that same rowboat moving forward, even though we're gonna have differences that we're still moving forward for a long-term, I think best regional model that we have of uh, inner, inner, inner working between different organizations. So we're all in a different areas trying to do that, but we figure this is probably the best model that we have. So let's make it better. Okay. So anyway, there you go. So having a common understanding of where you're coming from and where you're going. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. Let's hear from you all.
I get to introduce Commissioner Mariella Smith. Um, she has uh, 20 years of experience running her own uh, graphic design business, but she's also very well known and respected for being a community planner and an environmental activist. And that's actually how I was familiar with Mariella by reputation before having the chance to meet her in person. Um, she loves the outdoors and she and her husband love to hike, uh, bike and kayak. And um, I believe I heard her say on the phone that she lives on the Manatee River and um, just sounds like she just really uh, loves and enjoys the beauty of her community. Um, the, the unique thing that a lot of people may not know is that Mariella is half Cuban, to which Commissioner Oakley asked, which half? <laughs> <laughs> and that would be the mother. So. All right. <laughs> Mariella Smith. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe you all have something in common with I heard your the love biking. of the outdoors and biking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although it sounds like you might be more adventurous. I'll take it off. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Pardon? All right, go ahead. So, can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, it's my turn to introduce Commissioner Ron Oakley, um, who was born and raised in Dade City. We have a lot of Florida roots in our group, um, and, and he uh, grew up in his family's uh, citrus and agricultural and cattle businesses. Um, I believe I heard him say they also operate a cemetery. Um, and um, after um, a good time in that, he's, he's gone into um, public service, uh, including being appointed to the board of Swift Mud. Um, which I think is, is experience that can be very valuable here. And um, many other uh, public service uh, volunteer positions. Um, so uh, Commissioner Oakley is my kind of politician. He votes his conscience. He um, votes what's best for the people, um, uh, regardless of uh, any uh, other political forces and pressures. And so I really respect that, and I think we're lucky to have him here. Commissioner Oakley. Okay. I just want to uh, introduce uh, Councilwoman Rice. And she moved here from uh, Virginia area into Florida, and she told me that her grandfather was actually in farming and agricultural business here, and so we have that in common. Um, in her 20s, uh, she, she doesn't look like she's very far out of that, but <laughs> she's, um, she got a degree and, and did, um, was in agricultural, and she loves gardening and um, plants that I don't have a green thumb for. I mean, orchids and uh, other plants that she has, and ferns and things of that nature. I think you have to talk to them a lot or something to make them work, and I, I'm not good at talking to plants. So. But um, she's done a great job in, in all that. I've um, uh, also, she, um, in, I guess, Pomp Pompano, that's where you um, pretty much moved in that area when she was small, and they kind of, that was their home. So uh, she's got a lot of Florida roots, and she, um, the agricultural part, I didn't know about her, but I knew that she um, likes to stand up for clean water, uh, an advocate of clean water and environmental issues that, that she's worked in for a long time. And, and I respect her for that. I actually respect her for on our board. I was telling her that um, I think she's a very educated woman and she does a great job. Um, I listen to her just as I think we all should listen to each other. So we always learn something from that. So um, in listening to her, I, my utility guy said one day, says, did you know she was making that specific uh, motion that one day? Because I answered 
I second that right away. And I said, I told them, I said, well, no, that, that's sunshine law. I'm not talking to her about that. I didn't know about it, but I listened to it and it was right on target. So when you listen to others and really pay attention to what they're saying, you can pick up whether it's right or wrong and all. But I really respect her for her education and, and what she knows about the water district and, and the environment, clean water that she does. So um, I guess with that, I can go on into the fact that um, we as a group um, see this meeting uh, helping us all get to know each other better. I uh, think it's very important because I think once you know each other, then you can work together better. And I think um, this group, I'd like to see this group as I see my own county commission. We meet together, we discuss and go over issues together, and then we vote together. And I think if everybody puts their best foot forward for our direction, and we see that as this bringing us together to, to have that direction, then in that direction, we will be leading Tampa Bay Water to the right place in the future. So pretty much okay. describes it. So okay. getting to know each other better is an important um, part of being able to move forward with some yes. of the issues that I you have. So. It sounds like that you all had an opportunity, in your case, to share with her, with um, Councilwoman Rice, your respect for her on the board. Yes. OK, great. All right, let's hear from this group. I'll start. I'd like to introduce Sandy Merman. Um, what a lot of people don't know is Sandy started in the Xerox world. She was an outstanding sales rep and then went into management. Um, and then from there, she moved to a nonprofit. And it was her passion for helping children that people recruited her to run for the House of Representatives. Um, she served eight years in the House of Representatives and did an outstanding job and, and even held a, leader, a leadership position. Um, which is uh, hard for a woman to do in the House of Representatives, so kudos to her. Um, she was born in Indianapolis. And she has one daughter and two grandchildren. She loves sports. Um, can't wait for Friday to watch the Rays. She's been an avid Bucks fan since the Bucks were established in Tampa Bay. Um, she's huge, uh, huge, huge, huge fan of sports. Um, during this pandemic, she has grown to truly love her backyard and has <laughs> made it beautiful with lots of landscaping, and, and, uh, and she really, truly finds peace when she's out in her backyard. Um, what people wouldn't know about her that would surprise her is that she is a runner. And she used to do races. She doesn't run in races anymore, but she uh, truly is a uh, love for running. And she is currently writing a book, Life on the Short List. Life wow. on the short list. Oh, nice. nice. Okay. Well, it sounds like we have a common theme of liking sports and yes. also <laughs> plants yeah, and like gardens. Sports if you're it's a common thing. <laughs> okay. Who's next? Um, okay. And I'm going to introduce Mayor Marlowe, um, who I've gotten to know as being chair of the board for a couple of years. I've gotten to know him much better. Um, his insight on um, the subjects that we've discussed at the board <clears throat> has really been valuable. Um, but as far as his career uh, highlights, he has a computer IT, but, and he helps businesses with their technology. <laughs> I would never <laughs> see, <laughs> see there is a relationship here. I'm going to drum up some yeah. business for you. Yeah, I was thinking that, too, as, as uh, we were talking about that. But he actually, um, you know, I think is such a, um, you're such a grassroots person in your community. He actually, when he got elected to the city council, he won by four votes. Himself, wow. his wife, his daughter, and <laughs> who's the fourth one? Uh, my son. Your son. <laughs> I lost by four votes. Oh, you lost by four votes. Oh. The other guy had the four votes and lost. Oh, <laughs> I see. I see. Um, but anyway, but he's, he's done an incredible job as mayor. And um, he, I think the most surprising thing that a lot of people don't know about is that he used to teach research methodology at the University of Florida, which is fascinating. Um, I always liked research myself. 
He, um, of course, has been born and raised in Florida as family. He has uh, seven grandkids. Um, how long have you been married? 45 years. <laughs> That's wow. incredible. <laughs> That's an accomplishment right there. Uh, but anyway, he's just uh, he's a really great, genuine person. I think his insight, he's just got such a calm demeanor, uh, really comes out with these common sense ideas and how we should approach things. So, so another good. instance where somebody's gotten to share how much they appreciate one of the other board members. Right. Um, I, I didn't <laughs> uh, and the other thing that uh, I wish we had in common, she collects black uh, antique cars. Um, oh, you know, in interesting. interesting. I probably wouldn't have lived if my daughter was sitting there. have uh, a lot of expectations coming into the room, but we had a hope, which is that by getting to know each other better, we'll be able to put our, ourselves in, in each other's shoes and uh, have a little better time coming to agreements. Okay. Fair enough. Well, it sounds like this was a, a productive exercise. Um, Carlos is going to introduce Steve Cyber very briefly, and then we're going to hear from him. Thank you all for doing such a nice job with this. Well, all of that was really wonderful to hear. Really, when you, when you hear all the individual stories, all of them are interesting. I find people's stories are just fascinating once you get to know them. And I do think you work so much better once you know somebody where, where they're coming from. And just what I thought, given the amount of time public service as a group you've done, I, I, uh, th these stories reflect that. Well, it is, when I say this, I, I don't go around introducing people very often uh, in my life, but I truly mean this. This is a really honor for me to introduce this gentleman. I've known him for years. Um, I consider him a friend, and uh, I think a lot of you know him. Perhaps all of you know him. Steve Seibert, and I'm going to read the, uh, the uh, kind of the, the cliff notes about him, uh, but then I want to say a couple of more things about him. Uh, and uh, Steve is the executive director of the Florida Humanities, and that's the uh, Florida affiliate of the National Endowment of the, for the Humanities. By the way, some of the work of that, um, if you ever want to see great bi uh, biography stories uh, go into uh, uh, PBS and see some of the stories that have been created by the uh, National Endowment of, for the Humanities. He is a graduate of, the George, Was of uh, George Washington uh, University where he was chosen uh, for uh, Phi Beta Kappa. And then he had uh, the good sense to go to the University of Florida uh, to go to law school where he graduated in 1980. Following graduation, he practiced environmental and land use law, both in the public and private sectors. He was elected to two terms on the Pinellas County Commission and served as his chairperson person, uh, during both of those terms. Steve was appointed by Governor Jeb Bush to be the Secretary of Florida's Department of Community Affairs from 1999 through 2003. Uh, from then on, Steve received appointments to a number of councils and commissions from four Florida governors, four Florida governors, both Republicans and Democrats, and the Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court. Um, that in and of itself may be a record. 
for 15 years. Uh, Steve has also served on the board of directors of the Mosaic Company, a Fortune 500 company. He currently, currently serves on the board uh, of the National Federation of State Humanities Councils. Uh, the Tampa Bay Times has described uh, Steve as a, quote, consensus builder with an eye to the future and one of Florida's uh, significant thinkers. Um, that said, as you all probably know, Steve was uh, one of the founding members uh, of the Tampa Bay Water, um, of Tampa Bay Waters, and uh, in looking back at the history of it and reading some of the newspaper articles, uh, a lot of people feel that if it wasn't for Steve, maybe Tampa Bay Water could not have gotten done. Um, a statistic which I read, which has to probably be in the Guinness Book of Records, the votes that were taken to get Tampa Bay Waters going, and that meant in different kind of political settings, you know, between boards, uh, be between county commissions, the state legislature, you know, uh, cities, uh, there had to be 198 votes for the Tampa Bay water taken. Of that 198 votes, 196 were in favor of it. So only two votes uh, that were against it at the time. That, when I, I, I couldn't believe that statistic uh, when I read it. Um, so it is, uh, it's a tribute to the people who were there uh, to be able to create that kind of unanimity um, uh, for the problems that were there at the time um, in terms of uh, uh, water usage. Um, on a personal note, you know, Steve loves the outdoors. Uh, certainly what I've, everything I've read about him, he, he, uh, he absolutely loves the outdoors. Um, and um, he also loves uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Had, had a fascination with Abraham Lincoln for, for many, many years, which I got a kick of because going in, I think you all saw that Abraham Lincoln uh, drawing. And it, it, when I saw it yesterday, I was, I was staying at the hotel, I had to do a double take, <laughs> gotta go back and then go look at it. But Steve has had a, a fascination with Abraham Lincoln. At one point, he said he even wanted to be in one of the newspaper articles that I read about him that he wanted to be president, which uh, I didn't realize uh, that was the case. So in, in his uh, planning career, and in fact, the pictures in the newspaper show Abraham Lincoln in the background as he's being interviewed. And uh, uh, one of the sayings that he had in his office, and he may still have in his office at this point in terms of planning, uh, his quote was, no amount of planning will ever replace dumb luck. And um, I think I would say that no amount of planning will ever replace either dumb or smart luck. Um, so all, all of that is good. Um, I think there is no, no higher praise that I can give Steve. Him and I have practiced law together, I mean, in, 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 in Florida uh, for, gosh, umpteenth years. I have never heard, and we practice in generally the same area, environmental land use. I have never heard a single negative thing said about Steve. Uh, he's always been a consensus builder, uh, and uh, it's my honor to introduce him to you, Steve Simon. Good, sir. <laughs> well, that was very generous, thank you. Thank you all very much for this opportunity uh, to be here. That was really nice, thank you. So um, let me start. I wasn't going to start this way, but, but uh, I'm old. And uh, that's, a long, that's a long resume to read. And I say this uh, truly. The formation of Tampa Bay Water was the most impactful and important work of my life. And for those in the room that were part of it, I suspect they might say the same thing. So with that context, let me start with some comments about the history of this experience. Uh, 
Often there is nothing less welcome or persuasive than to have an ex-politician come to tell you how it used to be to a group of current policymakers. I am mindful of that, and I will try to approach this with the humility that it is due. At the same time, because you are engaging in strategic thinking, some thought it would be valuable for you to hear the story of the formation of Tampa Bay Water, to better understand the reasons why you are here in this configuration and addressing water challenges in a regional context. So let me paint the picture of the budding water wars about 30 years ago, a little bit less. Some of you will remember this. Charlie will remember this. <laughs> Sandy will remember this. We were suffering through a multi-year drought. We had experienced several decades of significant population growth, but now, at that point, in the early and mid-90s, it was centered in the unincorporated areas of Pasco and Hillsborough County. Pinellas was in large part built out. The environmental impacts of groundwater pumping were clear. You had dried up lakes. You had cypress domes that were dry and the trees had fallen over. You had docks on non-existent lakes. And you had soil subsidence underneath homes buildings where cracks were showing up in the walls and in the foundations. The press, at that point the St. Pete Times and the Tampa Tribune, were covering our disputes and opining on them on almost a daily basis. And elected officials across the Bay were lobbying verbal bombs at each other in that press. The Water Management District had issued long-term consumptive use permits, and particularly to Pinellas County, so we were wondering what the big deal was. We had our permits to pump the water. The northern jurisdictions and the district were experiencing all of these environmental impacts, and they were wondering why the Pinellas leaders were so obtuse not to see the problem. Clearly, we had ticked off the legislature. And the legislature was saying very clear to us, you need to solve this problem or we will solve it for you. We were spending millions of dollars on litigation, during which time not a single new drop of water had been produced. And while we were litigating and fighting and subpoenaing each other, regional efforts in things like transportation and economic development were stalled. So the process to change direction, to form Tampa Bay Water, started. It was at least five years in the making. I think probably the really intense work was probably more in the nature of two or two and a half. And I think there were three key elements to this experience. Structure, science, and values. Structure, science, and values. Let me hit structure. So the existing regional water supplier, the West Coast Regional Water Supply Authority, the worst acronym in history, was loosely aligned and it was weak. It was operating more like, you, uh, like the nation did under the Articles of Confederation than it did under the Constitution. Membership was not equal in power and each member could singularly veto a project. No wonder very little was done. So over a period of time, we formed a group. We called it the Group of 18. Six local governments, three people from each government. Three times six is 18. The makeup was important. With the exception of the city of Tampa, an elected official from each one of those organizations sat at the table. 
we didn't delegate this to others. The second person that sat at the table for each local government was the manager, the administrator. This was brilliant. Administrators are trained to solve problems. That's what they do. And so to have people like, in my case, Fred Marquis from Pinellas or John Gallagher from Pasco, Dan Clayman from Hillsborough, these were very skilled, capable, focused people. And the third person was the utilities director. Prior to that time, the person at the table was the lawyer. We loved our lawyers. We had them all. But they weren't at the front row. They were at least one tier behind us. They crafted the deal. They made it work. But this exercise was more a matter of policy and problem solving than in litigating our rights. So we formed a new approach in the structure. Everyone had equal voting power, no singular veto power. One of the heroes of this process, Mayor David Fisher, gave us the core of it all. One day he walked in and he said, I know what this is about. Common ownership, common rates. Common ownership, common rates. He gave us a four-word line that I understood and we could have our constituents understand. Common ownership, common rates. We knew that new sources of drought-resistant water supply would cost a lot of money. We knew that. But we could pay for it jointly. So as you know, we sold all of our facilities, mostly all of our facilities, to Tampa Bay Water, and it became the sole supplier of water. I remember a presentation that I gave to a civic club in St. Pete. Uh, Jerry Maxwell was in the back of the room, and I do my spiel about the importance of forming this new group. Guy stands up and he said, uh, Commissioner, I just want to make sure I understand this. He said, now, you're telling me that I'm going to pay more here in the city of St. Petersburg for my water, and in large part, I'm going to be supporting development in Hillsborough and Pasco. Is that right? And I said, yes, that's right. And Jerry walked up afterwards and he said, you got it. You figured it out. That's ex that, that had to be, you had to be honest about what the process was. And all the while, as we're trying to rethink this structure, the water management district was hovering around, and they were bringing to the table $180 million to create alternative water supply, as were members of the legislative delegation that were expecting and demanding that we succeed. So the structure changes. Science. We truly talked about, the, and I heard it in your, some of your comments today, we truly talked about having data and fact-based evidence playing a role in this discussion. Let me use a personal example. When I was first elected in Pinellas County, it was an article of faith that no desal plant would ever be permitted. And the reason why was because the brine, the concentrate, would be so intense that uh, the receiving water body couldn't handle it. it. It would not be approved. It would not be permitted. And I did what I was supposed to do. I, I learned to articulate that as best I could. And so I gave a presentation once on this and, and uh, another hero in the process, the late Roy Harrell, a uh, really fine man. Roy was in the back of the room, and he came up to me afterwards, and he said, well, you know, you seem like a nice young man. He said, uh, but you're wrong. And I said, I am not wrong. <laughs> and he said, yes, you are. And he said, let me challenge you. Let's go to Tallahassee. Let's meet with the chief permitter, and let's ask whether a desal plant could be permitted or not. And so we did. We took separate planes. We went up. We talked to, I remember his name, Richard Drew. And Mr. Drew said, I asked him the question, and he said, well, I've looked at some of the initial data. And this point, we were talking about a desal plant on the Anclote River, by the way. It wasn't on Tampa Bay at this point. And he said, I've looked at the initial uh, data on this. And he said, 
I think it can be permitted. And I will tell you, Commissioner, that it will be permitted a long time before any new well field will. And so in this one meeting, in this one meeting, because Roy Harrell had the, the gumption and, and decency to ch kind of challenge me the kinds of things you've been talking about, he didn't do it meanly, he did it, let's go and ask. One of the key elements to the, to the solving of the water wars was put in place. The, the myth that it would never be permitted was debunked. Of course, as you all know, this is this interesting intersection of science and policy and politics. And it is a balance, and that's why you're here. But there was one other piece that was really important. The environmental impacts were real. They were real. They weren't happening in my county, but they were happening in Pasco and Hillsboro, particularly in Pasco. And The hydrologists told us we need to reduce groundwater pumping to essentially 90 million gallons a day. That was the deal. And utilities directors, in large part, said, that's not possible. You'll never be able to get to that. At that point, we were pumping probably 140, 150, sometimes during a drought as much as 160 million gallons a day. Well, no wonder there was problems. I follow your annual reports. And over the years, over all these years, I think with one exception, you have maintained 90 million gallons a day. The science directed a policy. We all did what was necessary to implement the policy, and we've maintained the number. And that's pretty cool stuff. That, in my mind, is good government. Third part is vision, structure, science, vision. This is the most important element to share with you. The vision was wrapped up in Mayor Fisher's four words, common ownership, common rates. What does that mean? Well, for us, that meant that water is a resource of the state, and it could only be dealt with regionally. Trust me, I wasn't alone in this. If we could have figured out a way in Pinellas of going it alone, we would have. If there was a way that we could have figured out a long-term water supply answer for just Pinellas, we would have done it. But it wasn't possible, and it wasn't possible for any of us. What that meant was that Tampa Bay Water would become this fair and transparent organization and would be the sole supplier of water. What that meant was that the environment, even in a neighboring community, mattered, and it deserved protection. What common ownership, common rates meant was that paying more for a sustainable, more drought-proof water supply was worth it. What that meant, interestingly enough, was that neither water nor most of our constituents cared as much as we did about jurisdictional boundaries. And to accomplish all this, what we needed to do was give up some political power and some legal rights. What this meant fundamentally is that we are a region, and on the issue of water, we should act like one. This was our vision. It was really hard. It was really hard. There was one night in my office. I was in my late 30s when all of this transpired. And I won't forget it. It was hard. We were crafting a very new direction than where we had been. And the pressure was getting to me. And luckily, about that time, Fred Marquis walked into my office. And I was pretty, I, 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 was, I was close to tears. It was, I mean, it was rare. I, it was more than I thought I could handle. I didn't know, I didn't know whether this was the right direction. 
there were a whole lot of people in our systems, I'm assuming this would have been true in others, but it wasn't in our, that were not enamored of this direction and didn't want us to go this way. And so you didn't know, but I thought this was right. And my colleagues like Sally Parks and others thought this was right. And I said, Fred, I can't do this alone. I can't, I, I, you gotta be here for me. I can't do this alone. I can't do it without you. We could not create Tampa Bay water without each other, without the votes of those almost 200 people. We couldn't create it without the district support and money. We couldn't do it without pressure from the legislature. We couldn't do it without the environmental community pressing us to do it. Critically, we could not do it without the business community that said, you gotta solve this water thing because we can't do any economic development across the region unless you figure this out. We couldn't do it without the perseverance and the, the, the leadership of key people at key times. And I, there are a lot of heroes in this story, but I wanna add, I wanna use one, and it's Jerry Maxwell. I don't think the general manager of this organization gets the credit that he's due for driving this every day, for appearing before dozens of local governments to try to make Tampa Bay water work. Structure, science, vision, leadership, patience, civility, the big picture, an enormous amount of late night pizza. This is the legacy of Tampa Bay Water I wanted to share with you. And I thank you very much for your attention and I think you probably have some time if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer them, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate you coming here today. Um, I think it's important for every, every board every year because our members do change on this board um, to uh, understand the history because it was historic. I mean, Lawton Childs and the bill signing and yeah. I mean, it was historic. But I, I just want to ask this question, because I know you keep up with it, and um, we're kind of going through it with something in Hillsborough just recently, too, something that's over 30 years old um, that we realize doesn't work anymore. Um, but do you still feel that this is responsive, effective for the three counties and their member governments? Or does, does there need to be a systemic change in uh, the formula or how it is? Because we're all so different. Um, our population growth, our economic development, um, transportation, everything is, is, there are vast changes and differences between the counties now as we have matured over the years. So I guess I just pose that question because I'd like to hear your perspective on it. The caveat is that I'm not in this game anymore. And I've lived in Tallahassee for 20 years, recently back to my new and wonderful city of St. Petersburg. All, so, I, I, so I don't know, I, I'm not competent to answer your specific question. Here, but, but I do want to say this. Even in Tallahassee, Tampa Bay, the Tampa Bay water model is rare. It's really rare. We've seen a number of water compacts, and there are people in the room who know a lot more about this than I do, but there are a number of water compacts across the country. There are several in the state of Florida. I'm not aware of any that are as sophisticated and co collaborative and brave as Tampa Bay Water. Now, whether that still meets your needs or not, that's, you guys have to deal with that. But I would urge great caution in going down that road in the sense that what 
was created here and what's been dealt with all of these years um, is recognized everywhere as something very special and very unique. I would love, to, I'd love to answer this. I'm the sorry. question was, why hasn't it been duplicated? Boy, it's hard to say this without sounding haughty, and I really mm -hmm. don't want to. But there was a time when the when the crisis was great. We were talking about the district was threatening, quite frankly, to turn off water spigots. I mean, across an entire mm -hmm. region, it was. And, and you all from Pasco know the story. There was some bad stuff going on. It was ugly and it was dangerous and it was, it was wrong. And so weirdly enough, I don't know why, there was this group and it was a big group of people, but it was a group of people that all got together and said, we got to do something different. So why isn't it done? I don't know. You see that group of people, maybe you're that group of people, I don't know, but it was you know, this, the, I mentioned Sally Parks or, or Frank Parker, who was just, nobody gives Frank enough credit. You know, David Fisher, Ed Taranchek, there, there were a whole, it, well, and some of the staff that are still sitting here helped craft this thing. It was weird. It was different. It was, it was I think, kind of historic. So why is it done? Because it's too hard for a lot of people to do. Mm. And we in Tampa Bay did it. Okay. Thank you. I have a lot of respect for you. Thank you. Thank you. What else? <coughs> yeah, Catherine. Thank you. Um, just to answer your view a little bit, and I, I was just a little involved. And I was kind of, I moved here 20, 30 years ago. So what, when was Tampa Bay Water formed? Um, 1996. Okay, so. 97. 97. Um, just really taking care of my twin. Um, although I did end up going on the school select board and helping right. vote. in other areas is that I would think it's kind of unusual when other counties and cities own property in a neighboring county um, and that was your water source yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I know that we were having to truck in water to feed our cattle and I saw many lakes uh, friends homes with lakes where there was no water anymore and they had docked to a mud pit yeah. so that um, and the cypress stones on our ranch they were all falling down, all the trees, really damaging our property. Right. So I think that made this situation a little unique, maybe. Um, but I, I, I wanted to ask you um, in your very interesting story about the formation. I remember Commissioner Hildebrand, I think, was in yeah, the, of course, the, the yep. commissioner from Pasco. Um, and, and talking to Pete Dunbar as we have gone through some discussions here of whether what, what the role and future of reclaimed is as far in relationship to Tampa Bay Water, is the city of, of Tampa's involvement in Tampa Bay Water? Because I don't, my understanding is it wasn't quite the same as the counties coming together. They kind of had to be coerced a little bit and the, and the situation's a little different with the city of Tampa. Yeah. You want me to answer? Yeah. Well, that was an interesting story. Now I, I'm kind of pulling this back from memory a little bit here, so give, you know. Cut me some slack on the details. Uh, I'd mentioned earlier that there was an elected official from every one of the communities that sat on the group of 18. That was not true of the city of Tampa. Uh, Mayor Greco chose not to sit on this uh, body. I think it was fair to say at the time, maybe still, uh, the mayor, uh, Mayor Greco was probably the most powerful political official uh, in, the, in the Tampa Bay region, in my view. Uh, I know, and so he sent his emissary who served the nobly and every every meeting a guy named Mike Salmon uh, was on, on and so he and we knew that the mayor was uh, kept abreast of everything that was happening we, we knew that um, the mayor had a personal story that was very important to him and he told it regularly and it was that when he was I'll get to your answer I really will but I want to I want to I want to work it down that when he was mayor in the 70s, there had been some drought. I'm not sure what the details were, but he had experienced the, the time hospital. when water did not get to the top floors of Tampa General Hospital. Right. Wow. 
And that meant that, and I think the top floors included the maternity ward. And he was that, as you might imagine, that colored his perspective deeply. And so he was not. He, be, he, believed, he believed in the regional effort, and signed off on it, but Tampa, we had to kind of dance a little around Tampa. They were, and we needed them. They needed to be in the, in the mix. Um, I, they were in the mix. Um, they had the, what was the, the reclaim? What the, they, they protected their, their river source, right? And you, Charlie, you remember this. I, I didn't hear the thing, but I remember Greco very much. I, in fact, he's, uh, he brought it up to me three or four times when I was chairman of the council, and, uh, and I said, Dick, I, I don't have a dog in the hunt, but yeah. if you want to listen, we'll listen. Yeah. And uh, then at the end, I finally told him, he tells me, what do you think? And I said, well, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Yeah. And that was my advice to him. And he tells me, what are you trying to tell me? I try to tell him, you're the mayor, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, But in a nice way, we, we sat down four or five times with uh, various people in the city. And uh, he said, should I bring it to the council? I said, I think you should. And you, you mentioned earlier there was 198 votes cast, 196 were positive. Yeah. I think the two negatives were from Tampa City Council. Interesting. Two of the individuals did not vote for it, and uh, for whatever reason. And he explained it, like Greco explains it, in a humorous way, but you understand every word he's saying. And at that time, uh, a lot of the other governments thought we were getting a special deal. And I told myself, we're not getting no special deal. I'm giving up 20 million gallons of beautiful pristine, pristine water out of the, the well field that we have, and we're getting paid for it, but I'm giving up what I had my, my bank account for the drought to use that well field, and I didn't pump it every day. We pumped right. it, not I was at the yeah, water yeah. director, yeah. but Mr. Baird, who's in the back, worked at the water pumping under David Tippin. Yeah. And the story goes on and on, and finally he asked me for the last time, Tell me if this is going to pass. I said, how can I tell you when it's going to pass if I can't talk to him? And he looked at me and said, that's your problem. Tell me. So I said, give me a week. And I gave him a week, and he tells me, what do you think now? I said, I got to see how they're dressed on Thursday. He said, what did you say? I said, I got to see how they're dressed on Thursday. He said, what do you mean by that? He said, people that are not going to vote for it usually dress like they're going to a funeral. People that are going to vote for it dressed a little bit more rosy looking. <laughs> and so I called him before, this true story, I called him before you can ask him, and I said, it's gonna pass, maybe with two abstentions, they're gonna vote no. And the vote came out five to two, and he asked me, how did you know? I said, just a gamble and a shot of it. And I took a shot, it was five to two, and that's how it came out. Interesting, that's a great story. I, I, I think the answer is that, as I remember it, and please, Barry or somebody, correct this record later if I'm wrong, because I'm really trying to. Tampa, the one exclusion that I remember was that Tampa protected a certain amount of MGD from the river that they historically right. had. And I seem to remember it being like 60 yeah. million, 62 yeah. million Something MGD. Like and they just were not going to go into the deal unless they protected that, that use, if I've got this right. So it wasn't, I don't want to diminish it, it was a lot of, there were a lot of negotiations, but it was one, to me, it was one exclusion. It was 82 million, that's what our... There you go. Okay. Permit is for. Yeah, yeah. Is that, did that answer? It was a long way to get there. Yeah. No, maybe? All right. I'd like to add to Commissioner Starkey some of what she said. Uh, Pasco County, the Tampa Bay water, was very beneficial to our county. Yep. Because St. Uh, county of St. you know, Pinellas County, had the crossbar well fill. Yep. They had a five or six uh, in diameter water flow that went direct to Pinellas County. Yep. And for us to grow, I mean, our county administrator at the time was John Gallagher and very strong willed person and, and brought us all to the table, I guess, along with others. Um, we were able to protect water for the whole region and not just for ourselves. But without it, Pasco County wouldn't have any economic growth. So, and the city of Tampa got their water from the Hillsborough River. They still have that today. Um, it put, Zephyr Hills is probably, and Mayor, I'm sorry if they're number one or you're number one in our county cities in Pasco County now. Zephyr Hills and Newport Ritchie are 
or nip and tuck on who's in one or two. But the city of Zephyr Hills had a lot of growth, economic growth. And when I got on uh, Swift Mode back in 2009, mm -hmm. I started working on an issue to get them out of, because they were uh, in a cautionary for water. They couldn't even put wells in that basin because it, all that water was to go to the city of Tampa. To the point that I formed a regional water area right in Dade City, St. Leo, uh, Zephyr Hills, Wesley Chapel area that we could share water because Pasco County up around Dade City, you know, we had a lot of good water source. But Zephyr Hills was kind of frozen in time because they couldn't get any water. They couldn't go drill a well in that basin. So back in 2009, I started working at, and before I ended up as chairman, I had formed a group that we could work on water for that region, that area. And the reason I did that is because Swift Mud was going to give us 50% of the pay down to connect that water area together. Yeah. So to this day, that was formed. And because of Representative Will Weatherford and Senator Simpson, that happened. And there was a $1.9 million project that connects Zephyr Hills and Dade City together with a water line right today, 12 inch water line between the two, and they can share water. So it helped the growth of that one city where they didn't have it unless we did that. But the fact of it is Tampa Bay water, regional water source for Pasco County was one of the best things that ever happened for us because without it, we weren't gonna have any growth. But it's, uh, we recognize that the city of Tampa has that water in Hellsborough River and that flows to them, so uh, it, that's been a help, and um, all that all that has been good for Pasco. Pasco sits very well. Commissioner Stark, you want to add something? It will. It absolutely will raise its head everywhere. Sure. Yeah, yeah, just real quick, there was a question about, you know, um, and you made the comment, well, I don't know what's going on here at Tampa Bay Water now. Yeah. Um, it seems to me Jerry Maxwell's comment about we're going to be paying more in St. Pete for supporting development in Hillsborough County in Pasco, question mark. Yeah. Um, that, um, that people are willing to pay more for drought proofing a system which again, you think about that, that if you're, if you're drought proofed, you probably take it for granted. If you're not right. drought proofed, you kind of forget. And then the final thing was that there are a lot of water issues to come in the state of Florida and we don't know what we don't know. Uh, it seems like with those three thoughts that there can't be any, I mean, without even knowing the details of what's going on, that a regional approach to water is just critical. I mean, I. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to talk myself out of it being critical, and I'm, I'm thinking that there's just so many unknowns and there's so much that you end up helping others out while you're trying to figure your own problems. I, I, just just a, a thought on that. Yeah. You... Well, I agree, or we wouldn't have spent half of my young life, you know, working with others to craft this. It, it, is, it is right, and, and it, I'll overstate this, and I don't, it, it um, be right in my words here. It was important for us in Pinellas to recognize the needs of the people in Pasco. That's 
weird. They're not my constituents. They didn't, no one voted for me, but there was this feeling across our, the group of 18 that that actually mattered. That, so it is regional. It's regional environmentally, it's regional uh, as far as water supply, it's regional as far as all of those other things that I mentioned. Because really, if you're fighting about water, the other stuff doesn't work. You, economic development, it, it, the, the, uh, the, when I mentioned the, the business community's engagement, they were stopped in being able to do things regionally for a long time because we were at war. And that made a big difference. So, so to me, I'm a regionalist, I've said that on many occasions, um, I don't, it, it has to be the answer. And to me it has to be the answer when the resource is a regional resource. I, I, I'm with you. I, yeah. I, I can't argue it any differently than that. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that perspective. Thank you, Mr. One thing I, I left out, environmentally, you spoke about environmentally. In Pasco, we had those um, well fields near those uh, cypress heads and things of that nature out around 52, just north of 52, yep. crossbar. They were drying up because all the pumping. Today, we're putting millions of gallons back out just in the 4G ranch out there just uh, near, very near the uh, well field. We're putting millions and millions of reclaimed water back out in that area. And we believe that result of that's gonna help that well field there, crossbar. Because that water moves underground, moves to the northwest, yeah. which is right where that well field is. So we hopefully, we're supplying water in the future through putting that reclaimed water out there. You all have been very attentive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and you all. I know many of you, you're really good people. This is, I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. So thank you for your service. And yeah, thank I'm you. Out of here. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we're going to come back for, as Carlos described, the heart of the meeting. So, um, Steve shared with you that his experience in the formation of Hammond Bay Water was the most important thing he did uh, in his career, and it, as it was for me, um, as the facilitator of the group of 18, it was definitely the highlight for my career. <laughs> and it's because of the importance of that experience for me that I agreed to come out of retirement and do this. So it's nice to hear Steve talk about what it was like then. It brought back a lot of memories. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Turn to worksheet three in your packet. So here's what I want you to do. You have at your table these three by five post-it notes. I have like a whole office depot back here, so if you need more <laughs> of those, I have plenty. But I want you to take those post-it notes and write strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So I want one per post-it note, and I need for you to mark it S, W, O, or T. So I know whether it's a strength, a weakness, an opportunity, or threat. And as you um, come up with them, we're going to post them on these flip chart pages that I have on the wall here. So one at a time. Please use your Sharpie, Councilman Miranda. Use your Sharpie, <laughs> not your pen, so it's readable. Please write legibly, because we're all going to need to read these post-it notes, and especially me, because I have to do the summary. OK. Remember that strengths and weaknesses are generally internal to the organization. 
opportunities and threats are generally external. Um, we're going to take them as you write them and put them up there. After everything's posted, we're going to review them, get some clarification if we need to, and then we're going to try and identify themes for the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Michelle is going to be working closely with Commissioner Smith so that she can participate fully in that. Okay, any questions? Okay, go ahead. Let me know if you need more post-it notes. What, what's the time frame that you're looking at for this, just so we have a... Um, altogether, we have about half an hour. Half an hour, okay. Sorry, well, together we have 50 minutes. 15? 15, yeah. So I would say 15 to 20 minutes for you all to write them, and then we're going to take a look at them, and then okay. maybe 15 or 20 minutes to Got it. put some. 15 to 20 minutes for our exercise. <laughs> yes. Once you've written them, if you put them on the front of the table, we know that those are ready, and then we can be posting them up there. Yeah. Yes, with that one. one, that's right. Put the letter on top or someplace in it, and then one, each, each sheet, just one. Yeah, yeah, as many as you want, but only one per sheet.
læse alt.
It looks like we're winding down. You have one more. Okay. The first thing I want us to look at is how many strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats do we see? Looks like a few more weaknesses than strengths. Um, a few more strengths and weaknesses than opportunities and threats, which suggests that some of our problems are more internal than external, as you perceive it. Although, a fair more threats than opportunities from the external environment. Okay, so I'm going to read them out, and I want you to be thinking and making notes. What themes do you hear? On the strengths, current water availability. Um, similar one, we have the ability to provide adequate water to all the regional members. Common structure, common rate is a strength. Regional. Regional approach is a strength. Low staff turnover leading to experienced upper level management with a historical perspective is a strength. All players at the table. Fiscally strong. Well financed, robust, diverse water system, drought proof. Great staff, dedicated board members, current facilities is a strength, dependable, affordable, high quality water supply, well developed Tampa Bay Water alums group that is caring and supportive for a strong Tampa Bay Water. Tampa Bay Water is sound financially, strong leadership on the board. We've seen that a couple of places. Leadership, both the board and the management team at Tampa Bay Water. Unique utility design is a strength and a history of success. Those are the strengths. Okay, weaknesses. Executive staff engaging with utility directors. So, not enough of that. Turnover of the board. Future to equally serve each member on their needs. So, I'm assuming that means the future ability to serve each member's needs is a weakness? Am I getting that right? Um, response speed to changes, so we're too slow to respond to change. Appearance of a lack of trust of some board members. Partnering with counties and cities in creative ways to create opportunities for more public engagement. Not enough of that, a weakness. Lack of strategic planning and management experience. Pasco is a major water supplier. Unclear definitions in the interlocal agreement for recycled or reclaimed. 
attitude that the parts are greater than the sum of the parts or the whole. The sum of the parts is greater than the whole. Large region for board members to drive to central meeting. It's a weakness. Tra board members have to travel too much. New residents don't know Tampa Bay Water's history. New members don't have the historical knowledge. Uh, the need for more technology. A weakness is succession planning. A weakness this is sort of a weakness about weaknesses. Our weakness is that we allow threats to grow and take us astray, so not dealing with them. Uh, too much debt, transparency needs to be improved, and we lose sight of priorities and tracking progress on priorities. Okay, opportunities. Improvements with solar and battery technology. Opportunity to expand to new resources, potentially reclaimed water. Tampa Bay water, more widely known throughout the region, is an opportunity. An opportunity to develop a more cohesive board, focus on regional goals that improve our individual members' lives. Technology. Potential to develop new water supplies under Tampa Bay water, and that's emphasized. Diminishing debt will create opportunities to lower the rates one day. The growth of the region is an opportunity. An opportunity to continue Is that Maximo training? Maintaining. To continue maintaining a system? Maintaining? Oh, to continue maintaining a system to higher standards while tweaking it for individual needs. An opportunity to continue to address new issues such as COCC and climate threats, improve efficiency. What is COCC? Contaminants of emerging concern. To maintain the current members intact. Learning new virtual meeting technology, we've all had that opportunity as a result of the virus. Uh, water distribution. I'm not sure what water, what water distribution as an opportunity is meant there. Anybody want to clarify? That was, <clears throat> I'm talking about putting water where we need it and, and taking the pipelines and going out further in areas that were not there. We're working on some of that now. So, okay. So uh, that's sort of what you were talking about with Zephyr Hills and St. Leo and, right. okay. All right, now threats. Member governments leaving the partnership, thinking locally instead of regionally. Member governments who want to go it alone and undermine regional give and take. Taking our historical accomplishments for granted. Wrong decisions for large capital projects with lack of cohesive board. Growth of the region is a threat. Somebody said over here is an opportunity as well. Climate change, differing views on reclaimed. God bless you. Tampa Bay water needs to respond quicker to the county's water needs. New development without efficiency requirements and goals. To realize different member needs is a threat. Sea level rise, 
parochialism, water rate justification is a threat. Thirsty neighbors not in Tampa Bay water, such as Polk County. <laughs> Tampa Bay water needs leadership vision, not just management. Constituents become more knowledgeable about Tampa Bay water to the point of activism for a certain water issue. PFAS, which is one of those contaminants of concern, correct? Hillsborough County is lacking sufficient water supply is a threat. Okay. So, what do you hear? as themes. Anybody? Yeah, just tell me any theme that you have heard when I was reading them out. Well, I, I think that um, for me, I was hearing regionalism, think that, you know, that we're like one family and, we need, and maybe some don't want to stay with their family. And I think that some of them have opportunity. I look at that as a threat. Okay, and on the threat side, we had some concern about parochialism. Yeah. Okay, another one. just say I'm genuinely concerned because there's way more weaknesses and threats here than there are strengths and opportunities and if we don't think that's a problem I mean that's a that's a huge problem um, and I, I don't even know where to start I think I'd have to go up to the board and kind of look at all of them maybe I'll do that I, I you Why ran over them pr pretty quickly and I think it's um, hard to find common themes, but I do think one of them, it just seemed, it seemed like there were several issues about mentioning management and vision. I, I did hear that. Say that again. Management and vision. Okay. Um, but I'm gonna go up to the board and look. Why don't you all go ahead and... Yeah. I, I was kind of... In, I, I know this, is, this sounds kind of different, but I was kind of encouraged that um, we have a lot of uh, perceived or, or real weaknesses and threats and that we're trying to look at things through a critical eye. Um, the, the, the strengths that we have and the opportunities are pretty basic in that we deliver good quality water to our, our member governments. I mean, that's, that's the strength of the organization. Um, with a, low, with a low employee turnover, we've got a pretty consistent approach to doing that, and we've done it well for many years. So to me, um, it's, we have some of those strengths. We have some opportunities to improve on any of that area, whether it's water quality, additional water supply Perfect. projects, or Perfect. whatever. But I, mean, I think to be able to look at a... To be able to look at our organization with a critical eye, for its weaknesses is really important because if we're, if we've got, you can see some turbulent waters out there and I think we have to be, we have to be really upfront and face them and okay. not be afraid to talk about so them. So you think and it's helpful that we see yeah, those I do. weaknesses and I do. threats up there? I thought some of the comments that Steve made today were just so spot on uh -huh. in terms of where we go from here okay. and, how, and you know, some of those threats that are out there. Okay. You know. Um, what about those weaknesses and threats? Do you see some common themes in what people identified? Um, besides the one that uh, 
Commissioner Starkey mentioned about regional focus versus the parochial focus. And you all feel free to go up and take a look at things. If I went through them too fast, I apologize. I think these are more, uh, I'm not so sure threats is the right term, but challenges. And as Commissioner Edgars correctly pointed out, the fact that we're identifying these is the first step towards addressing them. Okay. So that's a, a strength, actually. That, that, that is actually, to... actually a strength that we, we are looking at down the road, what are the, what are the issues that, that we're going to have to face over the next few years? I, I think sometimes having a too operational approach versus a strategic approach and and I know that, you know, they kind of start to overlap a little bit, but I think strategic thinking um, is really critically important. Uh, I think in the next three to five years, it's going to be really important as, that we do lots of that. Um, uh, and um, I think we've got some really good people. I'm, I'm not as worried about the operational operation of the organization as I am the strategic strengths or weaknesses of the operation. Okay. I, I saw up there also that the, just the general knowledge of Tampa Bay water in the region. Um, and I do think we've gotten better at that, but it still um, needs to continue to grow. Um, because I don't think most people understand, but their water bill really is a water rate that comes from Tampa Bay water not the county that's sending yeah. the bill. And most people, that's why I think if constituents wake up one day and realize that, they're gonna say, well, who's this Tampa Bay water? And then, you know, that opens up a whole deal. You know, we have, of course, I know in Pasco and in Hillsborough, um, we have a lot of residents that have moved here from other states that don't have water issues. And do they know how important it is to um, treat water um, preciously mm -hmm. in our area? I'm not sure people really understand uh, what we, where we've been, and how, um, for, and what a great job Tampa Bay Water is doing. But why, you know, how we have to be great stewards of, of, of our water usage? Definitely, okay. reclaim was up there. Reclaim, uh huh, several times. Um, it's, it's so interesting if you go up and look because everybody's got there's a lot of di a lot of individual ideas yeah. it's not yeah. necessarily a real common thread okay so you don't see a lot of common themes not, up there not too much a lot about the budget, but it, it, there's not a common thread, like rates and um, we're sound financially, debt, different things like that, but not any common thread about the budget other than we're sound financially, that type of thing. You know, the, the concept of, um, you know, of, of understanding, I mean, at this board level, but um, in our residents, um, the idea of being drought proof and what that means, how that translates to maybe a little bit higher water cost. It's not just one source of water. And I, and I think yeah. that, that appreciation or lack of can create a problem, uh, whether it's at the board level or whether it's at our residence level, because they start to understand that Tampa Bay water setting our rates, my gosh, they could be cheaper if we do it this way. Right. But understanding that we bring three or four, right now, three or four qual types of water to the table so that we can avoid those drought problems, right. or so we can avoid an over-dependence on one type of water. Okay. So that continues to be something that I think we need to be leaders in, and that is finding alternative sources of water that uh, continue to make this drought-proof and independent.
Um, one thing that's not up there that should be up there is the legislature. That is a huge threat. A huge <laughs> threat. Actually, that's probably the biggest threat of all. I mean, they could Commissioner pull the Rubin, out. why don't you just write that up? Want me to write that? Okay. I can tell you in the late 1990s, when we did SWOT analysis, legislature was up there over and over again <laughs> under the threats column. Okay. What else? Commissioner Smith, did you see a, a theme? Or hear a theme? I think this is very fascinating. I think, I think uh, it's true that there is a lot of things all over the place. Um, but I think our strengths, just because there's fewer post-it notes, I think our strengths and opportunities are very strong and um, uh, maybe more cohesive, um, although less specific than the um, weaknesses and threats. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's been a good exercise for me to see what other people were saying because I, I noted a few things. I go, oh yeah, I should have said that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said that, so. Yeah, Thank you. so our, our collective thinking is really helpful. Councilwoman Smith, Bryce, do you have any? But it's also, um, that's a weakness that it's not out of our skill set or mindset or will to address and improve on. Okay. So it sounds like it's, people are not bothered for one thing about the number of post-it notes under each column. Um, people kind of see from a qualitative standpoint, the strengths and opportunities are great strengths and opportunities and important to the mission. Um, and on the other hand, knowing what the threats and weaknesses are, looking at them squarely um, is a really helpful thing. Okay. Mm. Commissioner Oakley, did you have any themes that you noticed? Mike, and I'm not Ron, Mike, turn on your yeah. mic. <laughs> I'm not concerned about the fact that we may have less strengths than weaknesses, but when you take the weaknesses, we can do something about them. I mean, we can tweak them this way or that way and then make them an opportunity or a strength. Mm -hmm. So by knowing them, you're able to guide which way they go. Because okay. if you don't pay attention to them, then they kind of get out of hand and and they get bigger than what uh -huh. they are. So uh -huh. I think so it's good realizing, we know them. Yeah, realizing what our weaknesses are makes us be stronger in the formation of maybe more water sources. So mm -hmm. 
I don't know what they might be right now, but uh, in the future we're going to have that. But as I was talking before about distribution of water, in other words, South Hillsborough County needs water in a certain area to grow. So the distribution and the planning that went into providing that pipeline that gives to the south and the pumps that would be necessary to do so, there's a lot of planning in that. Mm -hmm. So and and it's headed that way. So mm -hmm. um, even in our own counties, uh, we have to distribute water, you know, to the outlying areas that don't have that distribution at this time. Yeah. So. Okay. Councilman Miranda, a theme? No, not much other than what Commissioner Oakley was expounding on. Uh, the growth is certainly in uh, Hillsborough County and Pasco County. Uh, also happened to Tampa's within Hillsborough County. Pine Island has done a great job there, mostly built out. And uh, when you look at water distribution, you succeeded there. When you look at giving water to the region, you succeeded there. But as you all were speaking, I was just going back in my mind, reliving the whole thing. And, and uh, I don't know where Tampa stands in this, in this operation. I really don't. Uh, when you look at a business venture, forget about Tampa Bay Water, when you look at a business venture and you start to analyze if you had six customers, why do you advertise? You only got six customers. Mm -hmm. And I've said this before, I said when you go to the gas station, you're pumping your gas, do you ask yourself where did the oil come from? If you do, you better see a, go see a psychiatrist. <laughs> so it's the same thing with water. Uh, we advertise and spend money there, we should do something else for humanity, not for the city of Tampa, but for humanity. We have other things in, this, in the, the whole area, in the whole country that's lacking. Education, affordable housing, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And we're advertising ourselves. I don't agree with that. Never have, and more likely never will. And uh, when you run for office, you make all these commitments that you think you can solve. But when you're in office, it's very hard, very difficult to solve them because the weight of the needs and the assessment which you have to buy those needs are very very unequal and so uh, i don't know where the posture of the city of tampa is being one percent of something and and ability that's and, and i'm just speaking the facts i'm not against anybody i'm not against any other person I, i'm here and, and that's how the city of tampa feels mm -hmm. uh, my constituents and the constituents of all of us are very different very diverse uh, certainly, you need pipes to go to Hillsborough County where the growth is going, and I'm all for that. You need pipes to something solve in Pasco County, that's fine. But the city of Tampa doesn't need pipes. The city of Tampa can produce water to help the same area, but yet the city of Tampa, for whatever reason, historically, let's say, is not allowed to do that. Okay. So we have kind of unique, as Commissioner Merman was saying earlier, maybe a lot of differences in the situations of member governments and maybe that's a little different from what it was in the late 90s. Okay, anybody else? Commissioner Peters, did you have anything? No? Okay. Commissioner Ever. You know, just, just listening a little bit. Um, you know, I think we, I, I guess if we had to identify each of the member governments could identify you know, what their real concerns are so that, um, like, you know, Hillsborough County is get, getting some of that, getting some additional water to the to high growth area. I mean, that's that's critical uh, for them, and, we, and I get it. We even mentioned the other day in our executive meeting how there's a, there's a curve there in 2024, you know, where we're nervous, so are we gonna get enough water down there? Mm -hmm. and so that's a critical issue for one of our member governments. In, in Pinellas County, we get an excessive amount of, of uh, well water, which means that water quality and TOCs are a real issue to us. And so how that water transmits and stays in our pipes and our long distribution system, that's really important for Pinellas County, St. Petersburg, et cetera. Uh, Tampa has some unique challenges, uh, whether and, I, and again, not to get into all of their business, but whether it's their infrastructure, whether it's the excess reclaimed, what to do with it. Um, that, um, I, I mean, I think that there is a way for Tampa Bay water to be uh, part of a solution instead of part of the problem. And um, it might come from, you know, more listening, um, not digging our heels in as much and, 
you know, I certainly have been as guilty of that as anybody, trying to put my heels down when, you know, when Tampa starts talking about one issue or another that we're, ha we, that we're at fault about something. So, you know, I think that to, for me, it's more about really empathizing and showing a true interest in what each other are doing and the problems that we're facing and how we can be a solution. You know, we may, you know, I know there's a lot of territorial parochialism. We don't want to, you know, an outside group to meddle too much, but water being such an important part of the region and individual needs, I think it's just incumbent upon us to see if we can help each other out. Can this big organization help out with, you know, uh, reducing waste of water? Mm -hmm. You know, how can we investigate? How can we help with reclaimed? How can we, you know, whatever the system is, whatever, and we have a program going to try to s develop enough savings for actually another water source, just saving more water. So I think there's ways that we can really help each other out and be a resource. And maybe that's an area to explore um, so that we can address the needs of each of our gr uh, groups collaboratively instead of re uh, pushing back. Uh -huh. and so anyway, just kind of a mishmash of Okay, well, th and that sounds like something we might want to look at for future workshops for the next two workshops. Is there a way to identify the unique needs that maybe aren't being addressed, or aren't being addressed quickly enough, or whatever, um, for Tampa Bay Water to help yeah. to make it more collaborative? Yeah, just hearing Steve Seibert say, if we can't agree on water, how are we going to agree on economic development? How are we going to agree as a region on transportation? And that doesn't mean each of our counties and cities don't have individual needs that mm -hmm. the greater good will not take care of, but there's a real opportunity here to, to make sure that the thought process that goes into doing a good job on water transcends to other areas that we, we need to do a better job of. So okay. I'd hate to give up on the water. <laughs> uh, regional effort, so. Okay. All right, I think I, I've, yes. I, I'd like to add on to that too. I think that's really interesting because there's um, a slight, I don't know if tension's the right word, but understanding our role a little bit better because on one hand, I represent the city of St. Petersburg. So I represent, I'm here representing a member of government I'm also here as a board of Tampa Bay Water, so I think my task here really is to look at our issues as a Tampa Bay Water board member and looking at the region and feeling a sense of responsibility of what happens throughout the region. But there have been some times where perhaps I've been uncomfortable in making a comment or a suggestion about how another member of government does something because it's kind of going out of my lane. Like, I'm curious about what, for example, Hillsborough County is doing to require um, um, re reclaimed water pipes being built into new areas. I mean, I feel like, on one sense, I feel like that's kind of going a little bit out of my lane, but then as a board member of a regional water utility, I think it's on me to look at everyone's accountability to um, efficiency standards. Well, you know, one of the things that happens in groups is that people are talking and saying, you know, I need X, Y, or Z, and they don't feel like they're being heard, then they feel like they have to amplify that, speak louder, mm -hmm. speak more strongly. So maybe there's a little of that going on, and I think what Commissioner Eggers is suggesting is maybe we need to listen more and see if we can't be, as you said, part of the solution. Commissioner Starkey. Um, a point to you and a, and a point to Councilman Miranda. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we were gonna have each county's mm -hmm. give a presentation, then we can learn, you know, what, you know, I think we, in PASCA, we put in very stringent um, requirements, and I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing that with everybody, but I think we kind of got held up mm -hmm. because of COVID in hearing what, what each county is doing. But I agree with you. I think, I think it's very important that we're all on the same page, making sure we're respecting and, and being good stewards of water. Um, and to Councilman Miranda's discussion about the Hillsborough River, um, and I've said this before, um, and it's just my, it's, I just want you to know where I come from when you speak of that. I look to where 
and I Google where does the Hillsborough River come from, and it comes from the Green Swamp, which is not in Hillsborough County. So I, I look at the Hillsborough River as a regional water system, not as one for just Tampa. And, and, and I'm just letting you know where, I, you know, just kind of saying where I come from. So I, so it's, you know, if you own a piece of land in Pasco and you take the water out from underneath it, is it your water or is it regional water? So I think um, one of our challenges is people look at the ownership of the water in different ways. Mm -hmm. And some of us may think, you know, the air is regional, the water regional, um, and, and instead of thinking it's ours, is it everybody's? So okay. uh, that's so a hurdle for us. Hear, hearing some different perspectives. Yeah, mm -hmm. perspectives are different. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Whether my board feels that way, I don't know. That's just my personal view. <laughs> I have to ask my board. I yeah. do have a board member over there. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think I have a good sense of some of the uh, themes. Um, so that we can put those post-it notes where they belong. Um, and that'll come through in the summary you'll see. And you'll have an opportunity when you see the summary, if we got it wrong, to let us know that we got it wrong and correct it. What I'd like to do now is take a break for lunch. And then once you all have had a chance to have your lunch, um, Carlos is going to kind of highlight what we've accomplished and where we go from here. How much time does Carlos need? Half hour or? Um, I it's think we have brief. about 15 minutes. Okay. About 15 minutes. So yeah. we have time to So break. we put, we met, we said about a half hour for lunch okay. and then 15 minutes to wrap up. Yeah, I was up. wondering if we need to make a working lunch or if you had enough time, that's all. So. Yeah, I mean, feel free to, as long as you sort of maintain your social distance yeah. while you're eating. Okay to continue your conversations with yeah. each other. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and get started um, for a couple reasons. One, we get us out on time and bef maybe, maybe before the bad rains get here. Um, first of all, again, thank you everybody for making time to be here today. I think it's really super important that we that we do these three workshops. And so I'm just gonna ask everybody in the next week, take a look at your schedules. I, I almost duck when I say this to Kathleen, um, uh, that, uh, that um, <laughs> if everybody can just look at their schedules. Right now we're, we're apparently could only get together in October. I hate to lose out a month on the momentum that we started. And we get in October, we get start getting closer to the elections and so, I'm just asking everybody to look at their September calendars again um, because I think it's important, number one, for the momentum, number two, that it gets even crazier as we get later in the year. So please take a look at that. I'm, I'm not saying that we have to have eight like we did today to have a, a workshop. We could do it with seven in person. I think it's really valuable to be in person. Please take a look at that. And the final thing I was going to say before we go to Anna Lee here was that um, we had a very robust executive meeting yesterday. The, the, it's, it's on the website, so those of you who weren't able to see it, uh, please take a look at it. We had a really uh, robust discussion about the, the audit that was done the, the la over the, for the last five years, um, uh, and then also a little bit of commentary on Matt Jordan's review. So everybody take a look at that, because those are going to be, two, I, from my perspective, the two are the more important things that we talk about in August. So I would just ask each of you to just to take a quick uh, get a flavor for that conversation. And with that, Natalie, it's, it's all yours. Okay, Carlos is going to wrap up, but I just wanted to let you know that we did kind of a preliminary sorting of the um, post-it notes to the themes. We, I will, when I do the summary, we'll probably tweak the themes. I think there is a theme for staff and board capabilities. Uh, that we need to add, uh, and there's always a few that just don't fall under any particular theme. So you'll see, hopefully that'll be a little bit more coherent in the summary that we provide. Carlos? So the first, uh, and, and I'll be brief, uh, and I think we can get out on time. 
Um, I start out with the, uh, what I started in the beginning. This is the first of three workshops. So in terms of summary of accomplishments, I think we, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it in just a second, but I think it is a very good start uh, to create that foundation for the next two uh, 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 workshops. And obviously, you know, it's going to be more substantive, uh, but um, it's, this is a, an excellent start um, regarding that. Um, the ground rules, you know, if you go through the agenda items, the ground rules are there. Um, Annalee, I, I'm one to think, well, we, sh we should post kind of our version of ground rules and see if you agree with it. And Annalee says no. And she's usually correct about this, these <laughs> kinds of things. She said, trust them. And uh, her, her trust was uh, very well taken <laughs> because you guys put up ground rules that are very, uh, very good ground rules and would be uh, really in most facilitators' uh, view, the ground rules for, for uh, a continuing, uh, uh, continuing facilitation. So we did the ground rules. I think everybody, my sense is that everybody enjoyed the warm-up. I certainly enjoyed it. I, you know, personal stories are, are great, and it gives a, really a, a personality to that space. And so I, I think that was good, and I'm glad to, you know, uh, there are a lot of sports fans around here. So, um, <laughs> you know, maybe you all ought to go to the, uh, the Bucks or the Rays game uh, together without talking about uh, business. Um, I thought Steve Seibert, I hope you enjoy Steve Seibert. I really, what I said about him, I really mean, and I, I, you can sense his passion about what he did here. As attorneys, we, we do get you know, passionate about things that have, we've done in our lives that we're really proud of, and you can see how proud he has, was of this accomplishment, knowing that things, as they go into the future, you know, may need tweaking and things of that sort, but I thought that that was uh, extremely helpful. The SWOT analysis, we've just finished that and we got that. I think Annalie, like Annalie said, she, she will tweak that, we will tweak that as we put it into, into writing. And so you can see these themes uh, better and maybe add a, a theme or two based on, on all the comments. Um, so um, the next meeting is scheduled for October 26th. I think Annalie and I echo the comments of the, uh, the chairman that there's momentum here and to the extent you can see fit to try to move it into a September time frame, uh, we would appreciate that, but realize these are, these are difficult times. But uh, that's when our next meeting is scheduled. And um, open it up for any suggestions that you now have regarding topics. Um, or things that you want to make sure are covered in that, uh, in that next workshop. And I'm just opening it up to the group. Anything in particular come to mind? Obviously, we're gonna take from the SWOT analysis that you did, that's, mm -hmm. we're gonna take that as our base and go from there. Um, but if there's any particular areas of emphasis you wanna suggest at this point, I think, your, I think your SWAT is a good basis. Your issues list that you have here from your interviews, I think, was brought some common themes that were in here as well. So I think that's, I think those are the, the those key issue discussions mm -hmm. um, to have some robust, I think would be a good, good idea. Okay. Um, what, did you have anything? I, I was I'm going to suggest maybe, um, I, I thought the SWOT analysis was helpful. I thought even for more specificity, if we uh, kind of tethered this discussion to things like governance, budget, strategic planning, so that way we can kind of tease out some more specific comments, breaking it down into um, really a kind of um, groupings that follow um, the management evaluation. Uh, and then I think going forward, I think it's also helpful, and maybe we're getting there, but just to be more explicit about it, it's going to be really helpful to get a better idea, understanding where each member government is coming from, 
and um, the member government's take on things in terms of um, strengths and weaknesses, opportunities, weaknesses? Okay, that's a great point. I think the specificity comment is, is, is a real good one. And like the chairman said, remember we, we've already interviewed all of you. We know some of the specificity to the more general comment and, and, and hopefully that will be reflected as we move forward. Yeah. I just want to say thank you to both of you. I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed a lot of the comments that were, I, you know, when you work with a lot of people, you just see them once every 60 days or, you know, six yeah. times a year. You don't really realize who they are, where they come from, their background, and I really enjoyed the conversation today. So what I'm going to ask is that everybody consider yourself as me, and I'm going to consider myself as one of you, so that you know how I feel, and then I know I believe how you feel. And, and that's how government works, and that's how business works. And uh, government is a business with a different attitude, uh, because we're supposed to do things to satisfy everyone. In business, you try to go after your own customers and your own base, and the others either come or go, but in government, you can't do that. You gotta try to make everything equal and everything acceptable to everyone. And, and that's what I'm asking each one of you to do. Be me and I'm gonna be you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. And um, what worked and what didn't? Yeah, what worked and what, what didn't. Oh, Mr. I'm sorry. Smith. I, I don't know if you guys have had. I just wanna make sure you're mindful. Did you have any? suggestions for the next workshop. Okay. Um, I, no, I, I agree with the suggestion to, to uh, do the groupings um, and to include the um, issues list and, and kind of group them into um, collections. Okay. Yeah. Can I just add one thing to what uh, Councilmember Rice said? I, I totally agree with her comment. And I would just maybe put that in the context of um, not overly complicated because you can read binders, books, a volumes of things about strategic planning, but just kind of in a nutshell, a framework of, of a good strategic planning process, how the SWAT fits in, um, because I do think that uh, the board needs to be more strategic and I definitely think that the management has to be more strategic in their approach. And it's not just a summary of activities, it's where are, we, where are we taking this organization. So maybe a little bit of um, planning 101, just a brief kind of discussion about that framework and then without getting into a whole lot of that, but uh -huh. and how some of these specifics that we were talking about fit into that. I think that would be helpful. Just to get everybody kind of thinking that in that strategic process, however you guys envision getting us there. Maybe that's, okay. the, maybe that's the third workshop, I don't know. But. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. We'll give that some thought. Yeah. Okay, I'm hearing from you, Councilman Miranda, that the um, group exercise of uh, introducing um, each other worked well for you, that that was helpful to get to know people better. Um, how about some of the rest of you? What, what worked and what didn't about today? What, can, what do you want Carlos and me to take away um, from here in terms of how we structure and plan the next workshop? And I have another way for you to leave your comments more anonymously. Um, that bullseye chart over there if you want to use it sort of like the way we did our slots, write a little evaluation comment, slap it up there. The closer to the center, the closer you think we got to doing what we intended to do today. The farther out, the farther you think we were from being able to accomplish what we were trying to accomplish. We had three, we have three workshops and you all have an, a kind of an idea what we're going to try to umbrella accomplish in all three. Um, we, I don't. I mean, I kind of. Well, we know. don't either right now. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> we we have to digest this one, okay. and also with the, the interviews, and then get together. I got you. And okay. kind of talk it through. And probably talk a little bit to staff too, just to, you know, make sure that we're all on the right page. Okay. That's fine. Um, and you know, this is a dialogue. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, once we put something together, if there is somebody has a particular problem, I think they should 
get a hold of us before the workshop, you know, once we put agendas together, um, you know, we, it's a dialogue. We want, it, we want, we want your input. And uh, again, don't be afraid to criticize us. Annalie takes it personally. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, don't be afraid of yeah. doing that. We, we, and it's not criticism. It's making us better. Yeah. Um, so let us, let us know. You know, I've, I'm the long-termer on the board. This is my 10th year of being on this board. And I think today was very good. It was a great start. Um, good foundation was laid. Um, but just to kind of be honest, and we uh, need to spend time on the nitty-gritty issues and not dance around it. And I feel like... Um, That it's just too important right now, um, mm -hmm. and I, I really am not. Com I'm coming here to build that foundation. That's why I thought today was good. But next workshop, I mean, it's going to yeah. have to be um, not like this. I mean, you're going to have. We're going to have to really sort through these major issues, and they are major, um, especially for this board and for any other members that come to this board from here on out because we're basically laying out a roadmap. Weird. Thanks. I, I guess along those same lines, you know, I would, I would love to see um, all the things that we agree on and have 100% unity, and then those things that we don't agree on, and let's hash out the things that we don't agree on and, and discuss those, and then maybe when we're going through that, we'll be moving more things over to the, we all agree on this pile. And you know, maybe there'll be some um, perspectives some of us hadn't thought about before. But yeah, I think we need to discuss every single thing that we don't have 100% unity in. I mean, the big things anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, some of those differences are right here. And I think they got them, a lot of them, in the interviews. And we didn't get into those discussions today. And they're coming right here on this issues list at the end. It's just one page, but it I'm not saying it touches on every one of them, but I certainly think you captured what are what I would say are critical issues. Um, and, um, you know, again, I, I, I'm looking at them as a, as a uh, you know, opportunities to improve mm -hmm. this organization. And that's, that's kind of my attitude about it, as opposed to threats about abandoning the organization. To me, it's, this, this is a long marriage, and it's, it's got, going through some rocky times, perhaps, but I think we can kind of get through it. So I, I think this is a great thing to kind of look at and consolidate our thoughts. Well, let me ask you, um, do you think you would like to have a workshop that is largely devoted to the issue of reclaimed water and Tampa Bay Water as the exclusive provider of water in that in relation to reclaimed water? I think those are those are we don't need to let them bubble below the surface. Let's bring them up. This is a, that's exactly what I said. Yeah. Why, um, yeah. That's, we can't dance around it any longer. It's, it, we just need to go address it and figure it out. Yeah, like Charlie said under number 11, uh, listen for what people don't say. I'd rather just be hearing what people are saying yeah. instead of trying to guess, trying to well, what's it. Commissioner Merman really mean by that? <laughs> I, yeah, I want her to know, or, yeah, or, or you know, Mayor Marlowe, what, what, you know, so just, I, I think more of, <laughs> I think that's a that's a part we really have to be careful of. I'd really like to get it all out there, have a good good conversation. Yeah. Is that the issue? Yep. Do you think we ought to mm -hmm. tackle uh, that one? Uh, well, it's not just uh, re. I think it's just the reclaimed is kind of a is a big issue, but it's kind of just the water supply in general. And is Tampa Bay Water the sole provider? And Reclaim really falls under that, though some people might argue that Reclaim isn't considered part of our water supply. 
so then we have that argument. Right. So I think there's some different things in that, but um, I, I think it's generally the water supply. I don't know. Does the all chime in? Ma'am? Commissioner um, I think we need to be aware of each and every government and city of their issues, be sensitive yeah. to them and uh, understand that uh, the issues they have, like in Hillsborough County and South and delivering water where they need it and the supply of water, where is it going to come from in the future? Because their growth, they're not able to use their reclaimed water like we are in Pasco because our growth is coming now and with all the growth that we've got coming, we put in reclaimed water lines for irrigation also. We're able to use a lot of that and then we're also using out at 4G Ranch, we're putting that water back in the ground, uh, not pumping in the ground, but in ponds and things of that nature and putting millions of gallons of reclaimed water back that way. Uh, where city of Tampa and, and Hillsborough, they've been built out, Pat Pinellas probably the same way. They can't go back and retrofit reclaimed water to run throughout the city to ir do irrigation where they have to use potable water where they're irrigating like that. So we've, we've had the benefit of becoming in later as far as our growth, but we need to be sensitive to their issues and work together as a whole to provide more water supply and a better water supply mm -hmm. in the future. So that we all, and once we provide it for one, we're all sharing in that same thing. So, because our growth is gonna require us to have more water supply. So it's a big issue as water supply in the future, so. Any other thoughts about next time? Yes. Well, to continue with the metaphor of marriage, um, this is like couples counseling. <laughs> and for counseling to work, at least the way I look at it is, you put your cards down on the table and you hope for a neutral source to help figure out a way forward and um, but the putting the cards on the table and understanding where people are coming from and also how you see things I think is a real important value of the workshops because we don't always have the opportunity to achieve that kind of quality communication at a board meeting. Okay. All right, so we're not going to dance around the issue. This is the opportunity. Yeah. Okay. That seems to be the way everybody feels, so we'll do it. Okay. Keep, keep in mind, some of these issues are difficult, you know, and sometimes, you know, don't feel at the end of two workshops that the major issues that are before you are going to be resolved, but certainly sh it should be a much clearer picture and maybe process developed to deal with them totally and who knows we may deal how far we, we we can get but just keep that in mind some of these are uh, they're, they're difficult to in two workshops do them but i think we should attack them like you say head on well and be thinking as carlos said um, it is when we bring these issues forward, are there processes that you would like to put in place that the staff can take or some other facilitator team or whatever to move it forward? If we, you know, depending on how much progress we make in two other workshops, think about not only what needs to be done, but how you would like to see it moved. You want to turn your mic on? There are times when we've had these discussions at the board level that I have had to, I didn't have all the answers to put the cards on the table. I had to really confer with my utility director um, and, you know, to be able to know the details um, because I think we know the broad issues, but sometimes the details. Um, I just wondered if, how you all feel about at least having a, our utility, a utility director from each one of our governments be able to be here 
as a resource in case we need it. Um, I just think it might be important because if something comes up, you know, then I can confer with them and at least have all the information and details I need. Thank you. I think that would be an excellent idea, especially as we start uh, delving into the whole issue of uh, reclaimed. I won't uh, claim to be an expert on that uh, by any means whatsoever, but I've got people on staff that are, so. Okay, and knowing that that's gonna come up next time, you know, use the time between now and then to also get their input. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you very much. You Take, help yourself. <laughs> <laughs>